This webinar is part of the UKRN Open Research Series. In this episode, we will talk about data sharing and how this fits into your research lifecycle. We will start with introducing what data sharing is, then we will look at the reasons for why we should share research data, followed by how to share. Finally, we'll talk to you about how you can advertise your data. So what is data sharing? Data sharing is the process of making research data available to other researchers. Doing this reduces the duplication of effort spent obtaining and pre-processing the data. Research data can take many forms. It could be raw data that you have collected from sensors, web apps or experiment results. This raw data could be physical data, generated by computer modelling, or data collected from research participants. Alternatively, it could be secondary data that you have created by processing and cleaning the raw data, for example by removing outliers or imputing missing values. It could even be digitised images. Almost all disciplines use data of some kind, even if the kinds of data involved may be very different. All of this data is worth sharing. But do remember, if you are publishing data that originated from external sources, you must make sure that you have the original data owner's permission to share that data. There are many ways to share research data, however not all sharing methods are equal. Some are much more appropriate than others for ensuring that your data is stored safely and can be easily reused by others. We will start with looking at a couple of examples of commonly used but not very reliable or efficient methods of storing data. These are examples which we have all encountered in our own research careers at some point. For example, someone might keep data on their local hard drive, ready to share with anyone who asks. This might be done either using a memory stick or by emailing it. To find out how the data was produced, the recipient may have to read the relevant research papers or correspond directly with the researcher. Alternatively, the data could also be stored on a secure, backed-up network drive at the researcher's institution to be used by all those within the research group. The data could be shared online via a personal or group website or external researchers may have to contact the group to request a copy. While these are examples of data sharing, some of the methods used could lead to problems for both the data provider and the recipient. Firstly, data provenance is at risk when data is manually passed from one researcher to another. Data descriptions or important details of how the data was created and pre-processed are likely to be lost or misinterpreted along the way. Corrections could be made to the original dataset without the previous recipients being informed of the changes. Secondly, researchers often change roles and research teams can dissipate, along with the associated storage spaces where the data was held. Thirdly, data providers are also much less likely to have their data used as intended and to receive due acknowledgement for their hard work in producing the data. To avoid these pitfalls and to help us decide how to share our data and to make it more accessible, a set of FAIR data principles have been created. These state that data and the related metadata should be findable, that is, easy to find for both humans and computers. Accessible, the data should be accompanied by clear instructions for access and authorization. Interoperable, the data should be compatible with other data or tools. And reusable, the data should be suitably described to allow further use. More information on the FAIR data principles can be found in the links below this video. Data sharing is a cornerstone of open research and provides several benefits for researchers engaging in this practice. It improves the quality of your data and allows your research to be more reproducible. It also prevents duplication of effort, allowing researchers to focus on the important questions. It can also raise your research profile, as well as boosting your CV, in which you can include a section with data references, just as you would with paper references. Let's look at this in more detail. Firstly, adding this transparency to your research helps with the ongoing peer review process that all research is subject to, because others will be able to check your methods and help you catch any errors. In addition, the preparation of data for sharing encourages researchers to spend more time checking their own data for errors and thus embedding quality control into their research methods. Once the data is published, this process is extended to external researchers who can continue to verify that your chosen methodology was correct. 
This is not a process to be feared. Everyone makes mistakes, and the best way to correct them is to have a fresh pair of eyes look over your data and methods. This transparency will help to increase trust in your research. Sharing data allows other researchers to reproduce your results or understand how your conclusions relate to the data, which improves credibility. If people know that they can trust your results, they are more likely to reuse your data and cite your work. Also, it is useful for external researchers to know that they can reproduce your results exactly before they go on to make comparisons or extend your work. All of this maximizes transparency and helps to ensure the reliability of published research. Each researcher who chooses to be transparent with their research is also helping to build a culture of open science, encouraging others to be open with their data too. Building this community will also have indirect benefits, such as improving your access to others' data and promoting collaboration. Helping other researchers to reuse your work advances academic progress by reducing duplication of effort and allowing researchers to spend more time analyzing the data and focusing on the important research questions. It also increases the returns on your hard work in generating, gathering, and curating the data, as it leads to more recognition of your efforts. Through increased visibility of your research, it can provide you with extra citations and enhance your research impact. Now that we have established why you should share your data, it is time to address the question of how you can share data. There are no hard and fast rules on exactly how data should be shared. Each data set and situation are different, and to prescribe that all data sets should be shared in the exact same way would be very stifling for research. However, there are key aspects of data sharing that are broadly applicable for everyone. Next, we will discuss these aspects and how you should think about applying them to your data set. Pre-processing data for analysis is often a lengthy and complex process involving important changes along the way, the reasons for which may not be immediately obvious to end users. To enable reproducibility, it is good practice to clearly and concisely document each step taken. This will also help your own sanity if you continue the analysis at a later date. When sharing data, this documentation, or cleaned up copy of it, should be provided alongside the data, allowing others to recreate those steps exactly. Documentation should also include details of any corrections made to the dataset, explaining how and why the new version differs from the previous version. If you have written code to generate or process the data, this code should be made openly available and referenced. See our primer on code sharing for more advice on how to do this. The code can then form a further part of your documentation for your data. Information on how to access any original datasets used to create the dataset should also be provided. The documentation should also include clear instructions on how to download the data, what file format the data is held in, any specific tools required to open the dataset, and what fields are present, including details such as the units used and granularity. As you are processing the data, aim to make it easily accessible to anyone else wanting to use it. To achieve this, it is important to make sure that your data is presented as clearly as possible and that the variable names you use are clear, consistent and, where possible, conform to known standards. The units for each variable should be clearly labelled in the International System of Units where possible. Data descriptors, otherwise known as data dictionaries, should be provided with the dataset so that users know exactly what each variable represents. You should also make sure that missing values, especially in tabular data, are clearly labelled. This is usually done using the string NAN, N -A -N, which means not a number. Do not use a replacement value such as 0, 999 or minus 1 if it could be mistaken for actual data and make sure that you document what replacement values you use, even if this seems obvious to you at the time. To make the data files accessible, you should follow open data standards. Wherever possible, you should avoid proprietary file formats, which are only readable by commercial software. For most tabulated data, it is sufficient to use a plain text, comma delimited files, known as CSV files, or a binary open format, such as NetCDF. 
The JavaScript Object Notation, or JSON file format, can be used for structured but non-tabular data. Each of these formats has its own advantages and disadvantages, so we recommend researching them carefully before picking one. All of these formats are supported for major programming languages such as R and Python, making them accessible for any end user. Alongside the data files, you should also provide metadata for your dataset. This metadata should provide information such as who created the data and when it was last modified and what license it is released under. We'll talk more about licensing later. This metadata should also include a checksum for each data file so that users can ensure the integrity of these, making sure that they have not been changed or corrupted since being generated. Many data services will provide the opportunity for you to add such metadata to your dataset when uploaded. Once you have prepared your data, documentation and metadata, it is time to share them with other researchers. This can be done via online data repositories. The purpose of these data repositories is to provide a long-term, persistent storage solution so that users can be confident that any links and citations for your data will not break in the future. Storage solutions such as pen drives and network drives, as we mentioned earlier, or other devices such as personal web servers, Dropbox or journal servers are insufficient for this purpose. Relying on them could lead to the breakdown of reproducibility, not only in your own research, but also for those who reuse your data. There are a wide range of data repositories available, which loosely fall into three broad and overlapping categories. General, institutional and domain specific. Making the choice of which to use can be difficult, as they all offer very similar features. To make your choice, it is worthwhile considering factors such as the size of your data, who you think the audience for your data might be, if you require digital object identifiers for each data set, we'll explain these later, and how often you might wish to amend or add to the data set. Two well-known and very widely used general repositories are Figshare and Zenodo. These provide free space for uploading data sets, tools for managing data access, version control of data and metadata, and the creation of unique digital object identifiers. Institutional repositories can be more bespoke, but increasingly institutions are signing deals with the bigger players and offer similar services to the open repositories to their researchers. However, they will also generally offer a far greater storage capacity per dataset than the free services provide. Their service may also be backed by a data team who can check your deposit before it is published to help ensure it is well organised, formatted and documented. Domain specific data repositories such as the UK Data Service or the NERC Environmental Data Service provide a more curated data storage solution. The process of uploading your data to their repositories will be more involved, as you will have to demonstrate that your data fits into the remit of the particular data centre you've chosen, and follows their guidelines for formatting and documentation. This may feel like more work, but these centres will also have staff available to advise you, and going through this process will, as for all peer review, help you make sure that you don't miss any important aspects of making your data fair. It is important that you attach a license to your data. These are legal documents that specify how the data can be used. Don't worry though, this rarely involves the use of any legal professionals. The process is usually as simple as browsing online to find licenses that fit your requirements or adapting one, and then specifying the license in the description or metadata of your dataset. Examples of common license types for datasets can be found online. See the associated video links. An example of a commonly used open data license is the Creative Commons Attribution License. This allows fair usage of the data as long as credit is provided for the original dataset. If you are still carrying out research using your data, you may wish to consider an embargo period on its use. If this might be important to you, then make sure your repository of choice supports it. Embargoes can help you avoid being beaten to publication of research. However, in truth, such instances are quite rare and in most instances, embargo periods will not be needed. A Digital Object Identifier, or DOI, is a persistent and unique text code that links to a single digital object, such as a paper or your dataset. 
Having a DOI essentially turns your dataset into a publication. Anyone discussing or referring to your dataset, for example via paper citations or publishing new datasets that use your data, can use the DOI so people can easily find your work. To obtain a DOI for your dataset, there are many free and easy to use online resources, but you can also often create them using the data repository. For example, Figshare and Zenodo both provide this service. Once you've generated a DOI, you cannot make any changes to your dataset. If you do make changes to your dataset after it has been published, it is a good idea to generate a new DOI for each version so that users of your data can easily specify which version they used when running their analysis or experiments. Some repositories expect the data to be finished and not changed after first publication, while others allow for changes and the minting of new DOIs for each version of the dataset. If this feature would be important to you, then you should check in advance that your chosen repository will support this. Making your data open and accessible for other researchers to use is good, but you also need to think about how to make sure other researchers are aware of this new resource, and that your hard work can be acknowledged when they do use your data. The first step is a slight digression from the main subject of this webinar. It is to make sure that you yourself have an online presence that can be referenced. The best way to do this is to create an Open Research and Contributor ID, or ORCID, for yourself. This will provide you with a unique persistent digital identifier, similar to a DOI which you can use to link yourself with any public research contribution you make. You can also use your ORCID profile page to provide links to your research outputs to facilitate the discovery of these. The second step is to ensure that your data is as findable as possible by making sure it is all well labelled. These labels include the title and abstract, which should be as accurate and descriptive as possible, the author's list, which should include everyone's orchids, and where available, keywords. End users will want to reference your dataset after using it. To help them do this, it is a good idea to add a cite as or method of citation section to your dataset entry. This is simply the citation text that you would want end users to include as a reference in any papers they write. Many repositories will provide a template for this, which you can use for your data. However, you may wish to adapt that template, especially if you have published a data descriptor paper that you'd prefer to be referenced instead of the dataset itself. More on data descriptor papers later. Make sure to tell colleagues and external collaborators about the dataset once it is made available. Giving presentations on your work at related seminars and workshops is a good way to do this. Treat the dataset as you would any other publication and add it to your publication list on your CV and web page if you have one. Finally, you may wish to write more about the data than you have put in the data descriptor itself, perhaps to place the data within the wider context of your research. This can be done informally through a blog piece, either on your personal web page or on your institution or research group's web page. Or you can write a more formal description of the data and submit this to a journal as a data descriptor paper. Journals such as Scientific Data, published by Nature, have been created just for this purpose. Submitting a data descriptor paper will be more work than publishing an informal blog. But doing so will automatically mean that your dataset is put through peer review, helping to make sure it is as complete and well documented as possible. Most importantly, publishing a paper will help with recognition of your dataset as a full research product. Thank you for watching. We hope this primer has helped you to better understand the process of preparing and sharing research data and that you will follow these principles with your own data. For more information on this topic and for other primers in this series, please take a look at the associated links and check the UKRN website.